Namaste and in La Ketch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is an amazing woman who lives in Europe, in Germany, as a matter of fact. Um, Patricia Lindner is her name. She is known as the Magnificent Mentor. She's a success architect for ambitious professionals. She uses a lot of human design in her work. So if you get a chance to explore that, please do. She is or has worked for the government of Bavaria for nearly 20 years as a teacher to begin with and then ascending to a teacher's teacher, which is an amazing journey in, the, in and of itself. She's now self-employed uh, as a magnificent mentor, a human archaeologist and success architect. Now she says human, as a human ar archaeologist, I'll get that out, and success architect, she's got a diverse background in teaching, psychology, arts, intuitive work, writing, human design, and energy psychology that she uses to bring a unique blend of holistic methods and transformational experience. Patricia, glad to have you here. So wonderful. Zen, what a great introduction. So great to be here with you. Thank you for having me on your amazing show. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, we've had prior conversations, so we we know kind of the depth we can go to. So let's just jump right into that. My guess, I always explore their depth of understanding and their inner awareness, when they got in touch with that, how old they were, what process was going on in their lives and so on and so forth. So let's just dive into that when, because I know for you to be doing what you're doing, especially even going into the teacher realm, that had to have been an inner desire of yours to begin with. So when did you first begin to be aware that there was something more than the outer world and the internal experience that you were able to garner? I love the question, Zen, because it there is this quick journey back mm. that takes place when you ask the question. Um, and I'm glad that I never... Talk about flashbacks, right? I never prepare anything for an interview because I want to be surprised and... I am surprised by my thoughts and my emotions when you ask this question, because I want to say that this is something from the early childhood, but I didn't notice that this was it. Mm. But I always had this connection to something bigger. Um, I have a strong connection to like Mother Mary, for example. Um, and I would articulate it's the Sophia that. energy, right? <laughs> Probably. And I would articulate that as a three-year-old. Uh, and everybody, everybody was like, ah, oh, that is nonsense what she's talking about. And I even called myself Patricia Maria Dolores. That's <laughs> like Mother Mary of the pain Dolores. So I don't know where this came from. And I always had those questions. If you um, would... Okay, so let's just break off on that and, and unpack yeah. that a bit because I find it interesting. First of all, you know, the the questions that were asked, most often we don't get the kinds of questions that we would like to be asked in order to explore ourselves and share with others, right? So then there's the other side of, gosh, what is the history of our soul? Where did we live and be and have our movement in the world across the spectrum of our solar existence and incarnations, whether it be here or elsewhere. And, and I think we both agree that these things are self-evident based on the information that's available in the world today, that this is a reality. Yeah. So with that connection with Mother Mary, it is that part of a fragment or, uh, you know, one of the things, and, and the reason I say the fragment is that in reading the teachings, the Ascended Masters years ago, there was a being known as Sanat Kamara, who mm -hmm. uh, is supposed to be a planetary logos. And the, how he got that office was splitting his consciousness or fragmenting it a thousand times into 
others incarnate. So he wasn't necessarily incarnate. He had this massive consciousness, right? That incarnated a thousand different ways. And then he reabsorbed those experiences in order to understand the dynamics of the office that he was about to step into. I find that fascinating. Just to think about that kind of level of activity. Wow. So how would that perhaps apply in, in your mind? What was the first thing that came up of, of, with your connection with Mother Mary? Wow. And so, so, I, so first of all, I need to say I totally resonate with what you said. Oftentimes we don't expect questions like these because I could tell you everything about success and things, mm -hmm. but I'm in the middle of reframing what I'm really about to do and why I'm here. And so I'm grateful that we talk about this. I think there is so much synchronicity in what you ask me. Absolutely. So, especially coming out of COVID where everybody is recreating their new normal. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, so it resonated a lot when you said fragment, um, I never thought about that before. I thought like, maybe that's my spirit guide because I used to really be a big fan of cheeses. I, I used to, I still I re yeah, I, re I used to recall places I've never been to that were like those places where things happened and I could really have a picture of them and then look them up uh, on the internet later. I was like, I, I, I know that, mm. but I've never been there. And so. uncanny, right? Makes you feel really weird. Yeah. And what Absolutely. do you do? You just so, go, oh, oh, okay, right. <laughs> moving on. So, yeah, just moving on. And I felt like maybe that is so. I always, and I have been refusing to see what we are just talking about. Because it is easier to put yourself out there as I am the one who can tell you this step-by-step -step method in X, Y, and C to be successful. I right. can do the mindset the work. linear path. Yeah. But this is really... This, this is anything but linear. It's the non-linear approach of multidimensionality. I think it goes into a non-local scene yeah. right, as well. Yeah. yeah. And so I think I did not really take it that seriously. Mm -hmm. um, but, but just... What would you do if you did? What a strange part of all of that is. So I told you the name of uh, Mother Mary's name is Marta Dolorosa, which is the Latin name for her. Mm -hmm. And I called myself Patricia Maria Dolores. And a thing that is my ongoing theme in life, and I never shared that before, maybe a little bit, um, but not in the depth of what it is. to draw those things out. <laughs> there is this ongoing pain in my body, which sometimes drives me nuts which mm. sometimes feels like, oh, I just need to dive into that and embrace it fully to know where this is guiding me to. Because right, you can't deny it. I mean, you and I both know anytime you deny something or you keep it yeah. aside, it's going to keep reappearing in, in yeah. greater fashion for right. you to be able to pay attention to it because it's yeah. going to get your attention. Whereas, you know, and this is one of the things that self-love, right? You embrace all the parts of your being. No matter what, in love, just as they are, without attachment to change. Yeah. And then you begin to question, okay, what could I do? What if? Yeah. yeah. And so this is the aspect of the connection to Mother Mary. That is like she had such a lot of pain when it comes to her relationship with Jesus. Everything around her, just feeling this immense pain and uh turns out that yeah i've been Do you think the pain was from the experience or from the lack of his message getting through oh wow so first of all being a mother of two 
it mm. makes me give this impression that it is really a lot of pain when you think about your son um, needing to die, being killed. So I think that is a lot of pain. But also, I think there is part of this message, this message of love and resolution and liberation that didn't get through back then, maybe. And it wasn't is... like he was the first one to say it either. I mean, yeah. it aligns perfectly with the Vedantic philosophy that was in the Vedas 15,000 years yeah. or 13,000 years prior. Yeah. Right? That were all divine threads of unity consciousness or unitive consciousness capable of being God conscious. Now, that doesn't mean that we're the creators, right? And they are plural in the book. What it means is that we can control or that's a not a good word to use. We can create our realities. We do create our realities, whether mm -hmm. we're conscious or unconscious of it. Yeah. And I know you found that to be true. So where would that pain, because the trauma leads to triumph. How would that process engage you in, in moving from that place of pain to one of triumph and um, transcendence. Yes. <laughs> First of all, um, you talked about me being a teacher and that was for a reason. I think pain is involved in this as well because mm. as a child, as a pupil, I I could see that and that 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 was so in the early 80s i could see that there is something wrong just from the side of um how schools work and i could see there is something wrong in the education when i think of how i was brought up and there was a lot of um mental and physical violence um in my upbringing mm -hmm. so i feel that i was driven by this pain to create a better world, a different way of education. New um, coping strategies, right? For kids. Because Temporarily, I, anyway, and, and working on actually creating structures and things that you can implement yeah, to yeah. help your life evolve as well. Yeah, and just today, so now that is many, many years later, and I'm out of working as a teacher, I just had two hours of working working with my son and his friend because um they are going to write a final exam soon mm. and they decided they decided all by themselves it was a hard decision but they decided to ask me could you just support um our just studying and learning for the final exam when it comes to english because um you have a variety of cool stuff to share and then when they were working, I saw this amazing individuality and this greatness in both of them. They are so different. And yes, there were some, when you speak of grammar, there were mm -hmm. some mistakes. There were some misconceptions in what they delivered. But it was so great to empower them and to see their uniqueness in a different way. And I could see their faces lit up when I said, there is so much potential. You should continue and you should just try to be who you are and embody this. I totally love guiding you through this. Um, and so there is this connection to teaching still. Mm -hmm. And I have it too. I, I spent almost a decade teaching high school and special ed and even at a residential treatment center. Yeah. Wow. And just having this... there. Yeah, it's and... not being heard. And so these were adjudicated. They're either on their way to uh, potentially to juvenile detention or having just got out and need to process some things in order to reintegrate. Yeah. And most of these kids just want to be heard. They yeah. want someone to just listen to them and, and let them speak about themselves, their hurt, their pain, their sorrow, and their aspirations. 
and yeah. the teaching environment is in education today in our schools in America, that doesn't happen. No, and you you are meant to be part of a system that creates more of the same. And my son is one of those pupil 16 year old that want to break out of this crusted system. And whenever there is a task to do, he would start to discuss it and just look behind the scenes and behind the curtain and say, oh, this is nonsense. I don't know why I should do that because, and then he brings up an interesting aspect that Curious I did. Thoughtful, right? Yeah. Critical thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I can only support this. Absolutely. That's our is... other national deficit here in America. Yeah. yeah. Not only in America. <laughs> just, just. And we're projected on the rest of the world. I get, I've just lived in America and I've traveled the country and it's, yeah, we got a big problem with critical thinking. Yeah. And so maybe this wound or this pain is part of that. And also it's part of the physical pain, which makes me so, I think I'm this sacred rebel that yeah, wants to I would agree. Re reform or just bring some new aspects, a, a new awareness to people. So the next aspect is talking about medicine. So I'm not medically trained. I need to just um, share that. Mm. But I'm well read in things around medical treatments and medicine and um, also experienced as my father passed away um, because of a severe form of cancer. And mm. I could not stand the way that doctors, Western doctors would treat him or would want to treat him. And so I think that is, again, part of this maybe collective pain of not being sovereign, being treated like in this big machinery that creates money. I mean, it's, it's a cursory approach based on symptoms, not causes. Right. Right. How do you see that shifting? So I think there is more awareness in smaller or maybe even larger circles. Um, I still see when I, sometimes I go to the doctors and I bring up this different form of awareness. I just see the eyes roll, mm. but I need to say, I also met Western doctors that are open to more than what they, what they took on or learned at university. But I think that is more and more accepted it is more and more accepted that we are this body of energy. Mm -hmm. um, but as long, and I need to say, but I hate to say, but, and but as long and. as, and as long as the rest of it's true, right? And in addition, in, and in addition to that, as long as, and this is just my opinion and I hope no one is going to reach out and just harm me for that. But that is my opinion as long as pharmaceutical industries and the medical system just are going hand in hand. This is not going to change so fast. It's the mentality of the meter drop, right? The more we can burn and churn, the more profit will be had. And so the yeah. agenda of profit over people and planet continues yeah. and what we need yeah. to do is shift it to people and planet over profit which is the kind of yeah. conversations we're having you know I, I found it interesting you you know you mentioned the shift in how small groups and maybe larger groups are, are beginning to address yeah. this I, I have two things one uh, I went through with a psychiatrist after my spiritual awakening at 18 that told me I wasn't crazy I'd had a spiritual awakening and then took me upstairs in his two-story historic home office and read my tarot cards. Yeah. Now here's a psychiatrist in the mid seventies in the Midwest in a very conservative area that just totally blew me away that he was willing to even explore that, let alone share it with me. Then many years later, it was uh, after my uh, show on, on, uh, one world, I moved into a commercial project, and one of my 
hosts was a medical doctor who was a holistic doctor and had actually a special on ABC produced because he had taken a woman that came to him with chronic ulcers mm -hmm. and took her through various regressions, past life regressions, identifying where the event first happened, yeah. which was, according to her, she was part of the uh, French group during the Inquisitions. Mm -hmm. And they captured her and um, drove a hot spear through her abdomen. Wow. When she first experienced it, she came right out of the session, just hysterical. After about a dozen sessions, she was able to look at it, watch it with no emotional response whatsoever, and her ulcer was gone. Yeah. yeah. That's easy. Yeah, and I could be past lives, and I also am a strong believer in the fact that suppressed emotions, mainly anger or even rage, are causing ulcers, back pain, migraines. And when you treat them with medicine, maybe a, a painkiller is something that you would choose if you need to show up. Maybe sometimes mm -hmm. it's a bridge, but you, you, need to go, you need to go to the root cause uh, to resolve the issue. And so I think that is the way that I want to go, the path that I want to walk. So it is more to... You can own your power when it comes to medicine. You can own your power when it's a decision-making process, when it's your education, when it's religion, when it's spirituality. So you own the power. So, and I came up, so, and I don't know if this word is loaded or not. I, I refuse to use it. It's about healing. And that could be any sort of healing. That could be physical healing. That could be mental healing. That could be financial healing. So this is what is inside. And it just needs to be addressed and embraced. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful. Maybe undressed and embraced. Um, yes. Because right? we've got to get really naked with it. We've got yeah. to really look at ourselves at a core level. How we think and feel about ourselves right. and about life right now does this healing shift toward an attitude of gratitude what kind of difference does that make because i've heard you mention that before i think could yeah could you repeat it so i i heard you say when gratitude comes in what, to, right. what does when you make the shift from that constricted perspective to an attitude of gratitude, which which opens you up. What what do you notice in that process? So I think it is always, and I have this amazing um, person that I connected on LinkedIn. Um, he's the gratitude guy, and I think gratitude is such a huge door opener, even portal opener to so many things because it makes you wider it raises your vibration when you see things from this angle or viewpoint of gratitude um, it releases something inside of you there is expansion mm -hmm. and um i think it Lots is of brain chem uh, like of uh, a, a lot of chemistry shifts in the brain that brings definitely. up these pleasant hormonal experiences the cortisol which comes from the fear which condenses this so gratitude is the pathway to uh, i think health and well-being but as well but it's hard to be grateful for the trials and tribulations right how do you yeah. work through that the tribulations the trials and tribulations right the the crap that comes up that we have to face address move through yeah however we do it so first of all, I feel like um, when you face those turbulences and you see them as something that is so a trigger or um, the shadow 
is part of the whole spectrum so mm -hmm. you need to face it you need to address it that it builds a bridge to your magnificence to the light part to the love part and i think um for me a big shift took place when i got to know logosynthesis i don't know if you know it um which is um a model for growth and expansion and self-development and the minute I got to know it, I could deal better with those triggers, emotional triggers, mental restrictions, um, and could see them as a pathway. Because whenever a shadow shows up, um, it's got it, a gift. It, it is the gift. Because just think of the night sky, it is pitch black, dark. And so just look behind you and look behind me. Mm -hmm. You only can see the beauty of what is on the dark, like, background, right. because it is dark and the other part is radiant. So the brightest stars shine most beautifully in a dark night sky. And so I think we just need to see both ends and embrace the shadow and see it or embrace the trigger um, as a pathway to to the light aspect mm -hmm. now can you offer maybe a, a real world experience where something has triggered you 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 had a particular perspective of something the way you looked at it that when it happened it triggered you initially and then you saw beyond that to your responsibility in making the choice of how to perceive it or the perspective to have yeah so there are many so i i just need to decide i'm sure there are can you <laughs> there what flashed right uh, like earlier in, in, in our conversation was there anything so, that flashed immediately yeah as we said we can go deep um there is a big trigger that whenever i shared about pain I shared about um, me not feeling well, and I shared that with people, and especially, I just talk about the biggest trigger when I shared it with my mom, then she would dissociate. Mm. So th this, this, this was just cool. Hey, come back. Where'd you go? Right. Right. So I'd say, hey, there is a lot of pain. And I don't know. I'm so frustrated. I, know I can't stand it. I don't know where to go. No doctor can help me. And she'd say, oh, look. Was this there yesterday? Ah, and the neighbor. And I was like, what is going on? Why Isn't is that she so doing? frustrating? Because you're in a moment of pure vulnerability. And you're trying to be fearless in it. Right, because in real, you know, there's trust and there's vulnerability. Trust is love-based, vulnerability is fear-based because you, you feel like something could happen, right? And then, you know, to have that total deflection away from your intended conversation, uh, that's got to be tremendously frustrating. So how, how did you bring it back or, or have you been able to? So... Um, I need to tell you, it took me a really long time. I'm speaking of decades because, um, because you want it first of all, which means you're pushing or pulling yeah. her to move. Right. Yeah. So sometimes I was disappointed. Sometimes I was like, what needs to happen to me? Do I need to die so that she sees how I'm feeling? Hmm. So I had those scenarios. That's an extreme. Right. It is an extreme. And then I thought I need to become wiser. So I need to study all the ancestral blockages. And I hmm. really did deep studies in epigenetics, ancestral teaching, generation coding to understand my mom's habits and dissociative patterns. So this helped to some extent. So now then it kind of became the epitome of Tubby's fifth insight right seek first to understand before being understood yeah so i really wanted to just do it um with my my just intelligent brain mm -hmm. and understand what was going on and there was emotional well the emotional um, intelligence would come into it as well yeah 
yeah. because you have to create that space to communicate and that's an emotional process that's not intellectual yeah and then i did some logosynthesis just to help me live through the triggers and the triggered moments and so honestly and this is not a long time ago <laughs> I don't know if it is the constant work that I did, and I guess it is. Um, and my mom is still alive, thank mm. God, she's still alive. So I confronted Still working her. on her. I confronted her and I just said, why are you disappearing whenever I'm in need of your presence? Um, you are my mom. And so it was like this wake up call, I could see I could see a different face when I made her face reality. Um, and believe it or not, it shifted. It really shifted. Um, and I think there are many layers. There is her ancestral wounding, her upbringing, her horrible story of being given away as a baby and... Um, mm. So there are many aspects and now being confronted with what I needed. I told her what I need. And that was a hard one for me because I was like, no, don't ask people. Never ask people. Don't be a burden for others. I told her what I needed and she could receive it. And uh, this changed a lot. That's awesome. And, and sometimes, you, you know, the, now that you've expressed kind of a little bit of her history, sometimes we're bereft of being able to give others what they need because we don't know how yeah that's and the root so we're afraid to try and then dissociate right right and so this is so whoever needs to hear that when when you don't know what you don't know and i didn't know about her story of mm -hmm. being given away, being the daughter of a Catholic priest, given away uh, just from day one to a hospital where they would just do experiments with her. That was post-war. Mm. Um, and then finally, 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 after quite some time, she was adopted by um, some relatives. So this is just this bonding phase and the phase where a baby needs to have this connection to her mother, being left alone. So I totally get it that she needed to dissociate when it came to, ah, oh, I listen to your sorrow. I'm there. I'm full of love. I'm open. It was not something that she, she so it, it would have brought her to her deepest wound. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And proceed with the healing. I, I, I can relate to her being yeah. adopted at six weeks. Yeah. I, and I don't know what my history was from, I know I was given away at birth, so I spent some time in foster care. I know from being around it that I did not get the touchy feely warmth from mother that all babies need. And I've often wondered if that's what really gave me the impetus to see others as family everybody and not be concerned about getting my love from a single source in that in that regard and you know as an adoptee my parents were so loving unconditionally and, and supportive and encouraging me to be curious and mischievous and all those kinds. Of, they regretted it later. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, and so there was that mix of, of, you know, I started this way and then I experienced this. So why would I want to go back to the disconnection yeah. when the connection was even so much beyond that and gave me the ability to connect with others from that place because we're all connected right. and then eventually science began to prove that totally and now that you say it, so my mom is a great connector she has this huge family sometimes i envy her because she has this huge social network so there are similarities in your stories 
Oh, absolutely. So back to your story, though. In your process now coming in, that's one facet of it. And then you shifted from being a teacher into being this magnificent mentor, right? And you just mentioned it right before we went on that one of your stories that was included in a compilation just suddenly came to mind this morning. And so how did that affect you in, in participating with others and finding that reflection, that honoring, the acknowledgement of yourself, regardless of how the book did? Yeah. Right. The, the so. book sales, and national bestseller, and all that kind of stuff. That's great. However, yeah. the experience of it, what did that offer? How did you receive it? So, in the book, which is called Corporate Dropouts, um, it is initially um, an anthology of stories where women and men drop out of um, being employed and then becoming self employed. And mm -hmm. Interestingly, and this is like so many synchronicities, my story is called A Body Compass to Alignment. That is my chapter. Hmm. And so I think I need to really shift to this more of this, this, this healer part, but I don't want to call myself healer. Maybe um, it is more of alchemist, something like that. Yeah, because... Don't call yourself anything. Just do what you do. Let okay. it be fire, yeah. right? I, I think I People come you... up with enough labels. You don't need to have any. Right. Um, and so... Because I did not have the capacity or nobody in this crusted world of education could hear what I wanted to implement, my body, again, my body would create an Im immense amount of pain. I could not even crawl out of bed because my, my fingers, my back, my knees, my everything just hurt mm. so i could not drive a car and i had this leadership position as a teacher's coach or teacher's trainer and so i decided to um take one year off but of course as i said i didn't want to be a burden i didn't even want to be a burden to the government um thing mm -hmm. um i said without any payment <laughs> And I wrote this story down That's in this chapter. Of faith. Yeah, this chapter of corporate dropouts and um, my body. And this is what is an ongoing story. So I, I could not tell you, oh, I'm there yet. Uh, no, no, there are some there, aches and right? pains and some strange things going on sometimes. But it feels like my body keeps this wisdom or has the wisdom to guide me to more and more and more alignment. And so I thought, um, so I did all those thousands of apprenticeships that could be human design, that could be logosynthesis, that could be soul art, that could be improv theater, you name it. So I could really give you a list with thousands and thousands of things that I did because I wanted to figure it out. Explore. Right. You were curious yeah. enough and, and you had the ability, time and wherewithal to explore all of those things. Yeah. It's fascinating. And, and what a wonderful gift to yourself. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that because that adds another flavor because I thought like, oh, she's the crazy one that is the endless seeker of something. And I heard people say, ah, oh, couldn't you stop it? You are so like always looking for the depth of everything. Isn't Couldn't you just how people tend to limit others as yeah. well as themselves? And we constantly do that. We it's like we don't realize that you know the God participle, right? Yeah. It, it, if you're made with English and mechanic, I was an English teacher, and my mother was so she wanted a preacher and a teacher and got both and then some. Uh, she is uh. It just she was a wonderful woman and now i've lost my point because i got caught up in her recent passing and uh she had dementia for a number of years didn't oh. know me for the last five and uh 
at her funeral, I got up thinking I was going to, you know, go through this litany of points of order and, and praising her. And, and man, I just lost it. I just, I didn't ball like a baby, but uh, it was um, very emotional. And, and I did not anticipate it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I was going to be this stalwart, you know, 66 year old man that stands up in front of a, a group and, and delivers something, which I normally do. But this was just too much. And uh, I'm trying to remember what my point was. Just I think that is so important that you lost the point because one can see, one can really see and witness this immense love between you and your moms. And that mm. is such a gift that you just share it in our conversation. And I'm so sorry for your loss, Zen. Yeah, it, you know, it, it had been coming for quite some time, so it wasn't that much of a shock. It, and yet, like we normally do, I held back. The, the emotion is like, okay, I'm, you know, until that moment. And then the, the dam burst and away it went. Um, as an educator, though, teaching me English and the God participle, that's where I was going. Mm -hmm. participle is a noun uh, or it's a, a verb ending in ing that then becomes a noun or adjective so mm -hmm. I, I love playing with language right and and it's so simple mm -hmm. the participle is simply being mm -hmm. and that, you know there's so things like Wow, I never thought about that, right? <laughs> when it first occurred to me, it, it was like, oh, I got to share this, right? So I wrote a book about it called The God Participle. Um, one of my, you know, meanderings. And, and I love to be able to do that. She gave me the gift and the inspiration of wanting to write and express. Yeah. So I um, appreciate that for her. So <laughs> back to the storyline of how you took that chapter and now you you mentioned your self-examination further and looking at okay where can i go with this now that this gift has reappeared in my own writing back to me as a reference point to kind of wake me up again where are you going to go with it what what kinds of things do you believe to be possible for you to to take that and apply it professionally in the practical aspects of the work that you do. Yeah. Because that's where we go, right? If, if we can't make something practical and not necessarily always pragmatic, definitely of service to. Yeah. What might that look like? So, first of all, I think everything that I discovered for myself and for my own healing and expansion and growth is something that I want to give to the world. And one aspect of this journey was when I did a meditation. I don't know if we talked about it, but um, I was led into my heart space. Um, and the lady said, and when you enter the heart space, you are going to discover what you are all about and what your purpose is. So that is like six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I entered my heart space and it was pitch black talking about black again oh. and i was like really disappointed a little possibility I, though blank right I, did, I didn't see that so i was a bit frustrated but then um as i practice a lot of spiritual things and as i am a very visual person i just thought i'm going just on purpose i'm going to light a match just with my intention. And so that's what I did to light up my heart space. Mm. And what I saw was thousands and thousands of people in this cave and they stood in front of treasure troves or behind treasure troves or next to treasure troves. And I, st you, you talked about weeping. I started to cry because I lit up the space so they could see how amazing, how magnificent they are. And so now my mission and my vision is, which is a really broad and big one, 
I want to help people see how magnificent they are because there is magnificence in everyone. And that's not just the light end, but mm -hmm. that's also embracing the shadow part of who we are and seeing us as magnificent people who are here to bring this magnificence forth to serve as the you world. Are. To serve the world. And um, I want to help people heal I want to help people alchemize their amazing gifts. Um, and that could be in education, that could be in health, that mm -hmm. could be around stress, that could be in relationships. So that is where I'm. Well, and with the explanation that you had in that year, right, you've got a wealth of tools and training and material yeah. that you can draw on to yeah. help that process. Now, the yeah. other. Uh, you know, we always, in, in for marketing, I've got a couple of master's degrees in business and heavy in, you know, the first one, actually my master's was heavy in finance and I got into project management and organizational management. In the marketing aspect, we think that, you know, there's this push or pull in, in the marketing world of trying to find clients rather than placing yourself as eloquently as you mm. as possible and allowing that magnetism to draw those people most necessary to you. Now, that that takes a leap of faith, patience, time, and perseverance, and, as well as your passion and purpose. So right. how do you see that, which is from, from that perspective, do you see evidence of that? Yeah, because I used to book a thousand and one cookie cutter approach programs in how to market, how to build a business, because I am a teacher, as mm -hmm. you know, so I did not know how to uh, create a business and none of the cookie cutter approaches worked for me. But what you just said is like, this is working for me, just showing up in who I am. Mm -hmm. And that is magnetizing exactly the right people when they hear me speak about that. And when I talk about, I love when people show up in their weirdness, mm. because look at nature, nothing is just in order. And people, when they work with me, they say, oh, I just, I'm so hesitant sharing this aspect or sharing this picture that I have. And I just say, go ahead, yeah. uh, just share it. I love seeing who you are and there is no right or wrong no good or bad there isn't. and that's the reason i'm doing these podcasts with people that you know like you that are willing to step out and talk about this stuff to share these inner experiences that we're often either bereft of yeah. or if we do have them we don't share as we spoke of earlier because people think we're like kind of crazy in doing so because they're not used to that. It's an unknown to them. They don't know how to respond, let alone interact, right? Or share their own. So I'll, my hopes are with these kind of discussions that others will see, yeah, it's okay. Or gosh, I had that happen to me too. Now I might know a better way to deal with that. Right. Right. And yeah. they don't have it if we don't share it. And it's funny. I was just talking with a, a guy the other day that the in target markets, right? We we're trying to figure out what target markets were for him and his organization. It's called Beyond Being Human. So he deals with a lot of the multidimensional stuff. And you know, it's the it's the younger generation. And I said, here's some evidence. Uh, we've got fourteen thousand subscribers as of today, or thereabouts. And according to the statistics that YouTube offers, 65-ish percent of them are under 44. Wow. They're, they're in between 24 and 44, actually. Mm -hmm. So that's a thirsty group, evidently. And I'm glad that that uh, is happening. One of the main things that's really surprising and uh, 17% of my viewers come from Russia. Oh, that's interesting. It's not interesting. It's not in so it is it's so intriguing, right? It's intriguing. It, and I find the Russian population by and large, my wife's Russian. 
um, and exploring their culture, their educational systems, the kinds of things. And mm. what we were talking about earlier with Valentina Morovina and her uh, dissertation that got her the academician title from the Academy of Sciences, it was on the global mutation in humanity and, and how genetically the science in the last decade of her studies, which is what she drew from, she found the evidence that were of this global ascension that's taking place. Now that sounds really out there, right? But here's a scientist that's discovering this and sharing it. We think, you know, that maybe others in the country are aware of that and that's helping to mold and manage their culture and personality appearing on the global stage. Yeah. So I think one step in this direction is that you share about it. And um, I'm appreciative of the fact So I didn't know about this scientist and I want to dive into this study because that sounds really intriguing. It is. It, it's it's boring. It's a dissertation. You know, she speaks in, in Russian and it's mm. uh, got English subtitles. Mm -hmm. And of course, it, you know, she's delivering her paper. So mm -hmm. Uh, if you don't like to sit in a classroom, you're not going to like it. However, if you just read what's being said, it mm -hmm. is absolutely transformational. Mm -hmm. Wow. So Thank speaking you. of transformational and, and your process and, and acknowledging that, yes, this new notion of how to attract clients is more in flow, where it's based on vib vibration and frequency, rather than advertising and whenever i try to behave show up create in a certain way that business experts told me you need to do x y and c you need to wear this color just use this just use these words it never worked for me and i even felt like a failure well it wasn't authentic no it wasn't it wasn't and the more i grow into my own weirdness the more i find my people yeah and that's amazing how and, and there's science to back that up now um, yeah. one of the things that came out of my mouth and, and i often have these just really profound things come out of my mouth it makes me wonder where the hell they come from right and <laughs> yeah there's the words one of them was we cannot think our way through a system built on vibration. Mm -hmm. We have to sense our way through. Yeah. And it's backed up with this whole quantum theory uh, and even, you know, Urban Laszlo kind of backs it up and, and as the grandfather of quantum thinking mm -hmm. is that we have this capacity. And to draw and feel where to be, go, and do. And it goes back to the Vedantic philosophy and again, right? So there's all of this ancient stuff. How do we bring it present and applicable on a global scale? Because we need it right now. Our planet's in danger. Our people are in danger. We can't get along. There's people who are speaking openly about the rationale of how to get along. But because of the polarization, they're being seen as inauthentic or still this, you know, power hungry control monger, um, which is kind of, again, back to the critical thinking and lack thereof. We, we've been programmed. Um, and uh, Power Bloom presents it eloquently in the Lucifer principle of how a few control the media and light of the masses and they believe it. Yeah. Yeah. To the Unfortunately. So how do we shift that? How so would I you think... see that from your own personal perspective in your own dealing? But how could you advise another to look at things differently in order to glean a more clear vision and less chaotic. Yeah. So for me, it's not about fighting other people's perspective. 
because I used to do that. And that is not a long time ago. That's just a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, I think it is producing more of what I believe in and spreading more of what I believe in, just putting the emotions and the power into what I want to create more of mm -hmm. and not fighting what I don't want to see in the world. Because when I focus on what I don't want to see in the world, then it's I create it's... more of that. Exactly. Where and you think focus, that that's is... a law of attraction, right? Where you right. focus your attention. This is how I have eventually interpreted it. We've got to have, and with the element of advice. Yeah. Which I tend to always give. Right? <laughs> yeah. And the I'm just focus reading. and discipline of where we put our attention, intention, and interactions. When we can get clear on that, we don't have time for the distractions. No. No, and you can't convince anyone. And I just recently talked to someone who also read, I, I think you read it, The Psychology of the Masses, hmm. um, which is the fear-based guidance in the way that um, systems want people to go. Right. Um, I think it is really focusing on what you want to create more of and not fighting existing systems. That is what I saw when it came to education. I wanted to be the, the revolutionizer. No, what is the word? How about Revolution evolutionizer? Revolutionizer. Not revolutionist? No? Not revolutionist. That is, I would say evolutionist. Because again, you're not fighting. Revolt means you're fighting against something. Yeah. Evolving I, I, means that you're flowing naturally. Yeah. And I think I went from this place of, oh, I want to convince. I want to fight what is wrong to, oh, I need to let go of this fight and of this friction mm -hmm. that I create. And I want to focus more on what I want to create more of. And what I want to see in the world. Now we say that. What evidence can you offer in your own life that demonstrates that that actually is true? And so, it works. Just going back to what I experienced in the afternoon when I saw my son and his friend. And I just did it the other way around. I just let them be who they are. And now they came to me and they asked me, when can we do the next lesson? When so, and they really don't like English. When can we continue? They want to grow and they want to expand because I don't criticize them. And I allow my son, as, as you beautifully said, to be the disruptor or the one that doubts what is the existing um notion of something mm -hmm. um so i don't fight that i listen deeply i just see the beauty in who they are or who he is and so i can expect his growth without any expectation but i, I see it this is the evidence i see that my son is amazing he's going to be wonderful at what he does when it comes to relationships when it comes to a career that might not be mainstream right well and far be it for a mom to be prejudiced right towards her son uh, however with your background being able to observe that and report on it without emotional attachment gives it that much more credibility because it, you've got the two there. You're not just talking about your son. It's both of them. Where two yeah. or more are gathered. Right. You know, the old saying was, there am I also. Um, and it's true. Because you've got that collective curiosity, creativity, innovation, willingness to explore the other and each other. Yeah. As far as the goal that you have in front of you. Now imagine that, gosh, if, if we could do that more often, how much fun we would have with life instead of having, you know, the 
well, the, the Monday blues, you know, and Mondays, you know, we need to have Mondays like Fridays, right? How can we Absolutely. make that? Absolutely. And I just needed to laugh because you talking about evidence, what is an interesting and maybe a really positive development. I see serious, grounded businessmen. I need to make a pause and women <laughs> open up to discovering their human design, their energetic blueprint, their business energetics and rely on that they are uh, they have this energetic blueprint and that that this is so speaking their language that's their competitive edge i don't want to see people be competitive but mm -hmm. they they grow into who they are and they don't need to have this elbow mentality anymore no. because they are individuals that thrive without the pressure that they put on themselves, the control. Well, they they turn from the outer competition to the inner co yeah. competition with yeah. self. I don't know. Let's see what I can do. Right. Yeah. And, and it's surprising to you, which is also surprising to the others, because you've taken that competitive, got to be better than you yeah. out of the picture. You know, right. you just have to be better than you. Right. So I did not convince them. I did not fight people that said, oh, that is woo-woo crap, what you are talking about. So I can be there. And when people are attracted by what I say, what I do, what I offer, fine. But I don't put in energy to convince or fight anyone. Yeah. That, that's, that's no need. It, it's a waste of energy anymore. Now... In order to, we're kind of coming up on our time together yeah. for now. Um, what would you suggest for others that they may be able to explore for themselves and see evidence in a relatively quick manner in their lives based on the work that you do? So, and your own discoveries. Yeah. So what I discovered is one huge aspect is knowing thyself. Mm. And it could be just discovering the ancestral lineage or false narrative or the energetic blueprint. And I think that is the major aspect. Know thyself. And then getting rid of everything that is not you makes you grow into your magnificence and uh, without any effort. And that is really a fast process because I just had a lady who signed up for three, like 90 minute sessions with me. And she sent me an email and she said, and she was really devastated. She said, life is like a, vac a vacation because I see everything through different eyes. And that is such a major shift. There is no, um, time factor it doesn't have to take years and years of putting the work in there is something that is possible in a very short amount of time when you are open to maybe a cutting edge process hmm. and maybe not so cutting edge maybe it's just natural within you it seems cutting edge because you never thought about it before yeah, yeah. right <laughs> And we do those things that, that we tend to move beyond the simple because we think it's too simple. It's got to be complex. That's how our nature, we got to categorize, title, label, you know, compartmentalize everything, especially from a male's perspective, so that we can manage it all. Well, yeah. it's, that's that's you trying to manage it. What if, we, what if we flip that and let it manage us by the way we're able to pay attention to what's coming to us. I, I what do you think of the theory of, of life like a, a individual, like a tesseract, right? You're familiar with the, the geome geometric cube that morphs mm -hmm. and, and is constantly enveloping itself. So I perceive that, you know, our intentions are like the extension of the tesseract, mm -hmm. where it goes out and it touches things, 
We don't know what those are going to be yet, but it's our creation, right? Because it's what we intended to create. And then as we continue in our life on a daily basis, kind of like Rilke says, when you have the question, let life answer it, right? So you experience that and you envelop what you've created because it's seeking you just the same as you're seeking it. Yeah. And yeah how, do, how could we, first of all, does that make sense? Second of all, how do we apply that more often? Yeah. So it makes a hundred percent sense. And how do we apply it? So what came to my mind immediately when listening to you was we should, so I want to avoid those words. Um, let's shift from being driven by the past, whatever the past is, if this is this life or many lifetimes, but as you said, you are, so, and that is for me, it is thoughts and emotions that you put out there that create your future from where you are now. So you are driven or pulled by a future that you co-created or created, if that makes sense. Absolutely does. And yeah. I see it as harvesting our past. Yeah. And just cutting the cords of all the negative, false narrative, default circuitry running through your brain and veins and energetic fields and create this future where your thoughts and your emotions, when they come together, they are like a, like a, a canvas force. of force. Yeah. I and, love that. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So parting gift for our audience. A gift. Yes. A gift. So th there are many gifts that I can offer. What comes to mind is uh, whenever someone is open to a human design chart reading, and I can call it human design chart reading in your show, mm -hmm. uh, because that is known. I do it in a slightly different, very intuitive way. I gift 30-minute um, sessions where people can get in touch with their chart or just go in a certain direction on a surface level, but they walk away with a lot of benefit. Or the other thing is that I, I, I totally enjoy, I carve out space for people, I call them illumination calls, when there is a blockage, a pain point that they want to heal. And just think of pain in a huge variety. Mm -hmm. um, I just listen to them, listen deeply, and they are in, they have center stage. And we figure out what does it take to solve that? W what are the next steps? What is possible? And where does this come from? Why do they feel like they are pulled back or they can't move on or they can't resolve that or there is a lot of frustration? I give them as well. That is my illumination call. That is 40 minutes just for you. Well, what, speaking of treasure troves, what gifts. Thank you so much, Patricia. This has just been an awesome conversation that, was deep and wide and formative and engaging, inspiring and inviting others to step up into their greatness. And thank you for that. Thank you so much, Zen, for your beautiful questions, for offering this safe and sacred space and for having me on your show. Mm, my pleasure always. And namaste and in la catch. Thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and I will see you next time.